Today is Friday, January 1st, 2021, which means 2020 is dead and we're all better for it. Hello, fiendlings. How the hell are you? Yep, I said it. I'll be dancing on 2020's rotting corpse for probably the rest of my life. Face it, the year had it coming. Seeing as how it's now 2021, I thought I'd share a few predictions of mine for the next 365 days. Prediction number one. Derelict Shipyards will be finished by March 2021, and its podcast run will begin the day Trident ends. Prediction number two. The Black Extinction, the final book in the M2 cycle, will be finished in 2021. Finished, recorded, and awaiting a slot for its podcast run. Prediction number three. Paul E. Cooley will finish a new novel this year that has nothing to do with either Derelict or The Black. I'm not giving out more details than that at the moment because, well, because reasons. When we get further into the year, I'll have more details. Prediction number four. That last prediction will most assuredly be proven wrong, because life. As I've no doubt mentioned before, I'm a contract worker these days, and one of the gigs that has occupied much of my time over the past two years has run into serious financial woes, and, well, let's just say payroll hasn't been met, and that means I haven't been paid in a while. Thus, I will probably have to get another contract by end of first quarter if I want to keep the lights on and that sort of thing. I have three novels in progress, aside from those related to The Black or Derelict, a slew of short stories in various stages of completion, and two new series mapped out. I'm not exactly starved for ideas of what to write. It's more a matter of time and energy. Now that I'm 50, I seem to have a lot less of the latter, but that may just be due to my health. Probably a bit of both. Regardless, I'm still working on content for you and still tilting at the windmills of publishing and life. 2021 is a new year, so let's get this fucker started. Be safe, have a great week, and we'll talk again real soon. Here's episode 5 of Derelict Trident. Chapter 6 The cargo bay was a hive of activity. Loading up the SV-52, checking rifles, armor, suits, and listening to the corporal berate them for being so slow made everything seem normal. But the routine, the hurry up and hustle, did nothing to keep Dickerson from constantly swinging his eyes to the makeshift metal wall reinforcing the quarantine area. The pine cone was trapped in there, or so Black promised, but they were still going to have to deal with the damn thing. When they returned from SNR Red, he'd have a serious talk with the corporal about vaporizing the creature. Having it aboard the ship was simply asking for trouble. He still didn't understand how it had managed to tear through the stasis pod Talby had salvaged from Mira, unless it had been more damaged than they'd thought. The LT had captured the pod and brought it aboard, but they'd never had time to open it up and check the contents. The crew of SNR Black had been a little busy fighting for their lives and attempting to destroy Mira to engage in any scientific analysis. Not as though it was their specialty to begin with. Talby hadn't known what he'd brought aboard, and if it had managed to both escape the pod and tear through the cargo bay bulkhead, the crew might have awoken to find the pinecone floating above their faces. He shivered and slammed a fresh magazine home. He double-checked the flechette rifle, his remaining tritium flechette mags, and the rest of his gear. Kelly Mora had ordered them to carry extra suit patches, tethers, and as much ammo as they could fit in their pouches. Without a support skiff, the infantry only had the SV-52 to provide cover and ferry them to SNR Red. Tickerson? Carb? Kelly Mora called out, her voice easily rising over conversation and the clicks, drags, and clacks of Marines moving gear and readying their loadouts. He turned from the munitions locker and found her staring at him. The butt of her flechette rifle stuck out slightly over her left shoulder, and her ammo pouches bulged with extra magazines. Ah, Corporal? She gestured to he and Carb. Now what? Carb whispered. I have a bad feeling about this, Dickerson said. He sighed and rose from the munitions locker. The Corporal had flicked her gaze from his to keep tabs on the rest of the squad. She needn't have bothered. Wint had taken over her duties in prepping the other fire team, which made sense for now. The two privates, Copenhaver and Murdoch, knew Went and had fought beside him. Kelly Moore had been smart enough to notice the camaraderie and had taken advantage of it. Without Gunny around, she was making the squad decisions, putting together the fire teams, and deciding which groupings made the most sense. He smiled to himself. Kelly Moore was already the best corporal they'd ever had. Not as though that was difficult, but still. 
He and Carb walked as a pair to where the corporal stood. She didn't make eye contact with either of them until they stood before her. Kelly Moore's flat expression said nothing of the thoughts going through her mind, but her body language told him she was nervous. You, Carb, and I are going aboard Red, she said. The rest of the squad will provide cover outside the ship. A beat of silence followed as he and Carb took in what she'd just said. Dickerson shivered. It only seemed like hours ago that they'd been trapped inside a ship without power, without gravity, and without any intel. At least this time we know what the ship's interior looks like, he thought. Hi, Corporal, Carb said. Plan? Kelly Mora practically shrugged. We're going in through the cargo bay airlock. Black says the ship has no power, no comms emissions, no signs of life, nothing. Sounds familiar, Carb muttered. The corporal ignored her. We'll more than likely have to use the manual release to enter the ship. That made sense, and it wasn't as though the squads hadn't practiced emergency ingress-egress drills for their own ship. Captain Dunn had made that a compulsory part of their training. According to Lieutenant Talby, the captain had experienced some kind of traumatic action during the satellite war. Dickerson hadn't asked for details, but he was pretty sure he knew what ship Dunn had been on to precipitate the kind of fear that created a mandatory training exercise. The LT making a flyby first? Carb asked. Of course, Kelly Morris said. No infantry out the door until we have a sweep. Hurry up and wait, Dickerson muttered as he checked his loadout for the third time. So infantry suits up and waits for the ferry. You got it, Kelly Morris said. As soon as he's ready, the lieutenant will take the SV-52 out for a recon. We'll remain here inside the cargo bay until he finishes his sweep. After that, there'll be time to maglock to the 52 and hitch a ride. Hitch a ride, Carb said. We could just float out there. Kelly Morris shook her head. Lieutenant's orders, she said. We do it his way. Hi, boss, Carb said. Dickerson? He looked down and met the corporal's eyes. Ah, your strap is undone she said and pointed to the dangling strap near his pouches. He cursed and quickly snapped it into place. Thanks, boss. Welcome, Marine, Kelly Moore said. Be ready. Rather than waiting for a response, Kelly Moore turned on her heel and walked to Wentz's squad. What do you think? Carb asked. About what? She idly scratched at her shoulder. No doubt her own nannies had been doing some repair work on their trip back from Pluto. How this is going to go? Fubar, he whispered. Carb made a sound that someone might have mistaken for a sob, but he knew from long experience it meant she was in complete agreement. Fubar, she echoed. I don't think that term properly conveys just how fucked we are. Chapter 7 The SV-52 glided slowly and silently from the cargo bay. Oaks had placed SNR Black some 30 meters away from the other ship, matching its speed, but not its attitude. Red, much like Mira, had either collided with a large object or had suffered another calamity. As Talby flipped the SV-52 and proceeded beneath Black's hull, he hoped it was the former and not the latter. The last thing he needed was to find something new and nasty was responsible. He unfocused the spotlights to provide a greater field of illumination. Black had already performed several scans of the dead ship's hull and found nothing out of the ordinary. But Talby still wanted an up-close and personal inspection. Dunn had agreed. Black's cameras were more than capable of inspection, but what she lacked was precision in targeting specific areas. She would no doubt disagree. Her instruments were more than capable enough, but it was the lie they'd had to spin. He was sure the AI saw through it for what it was. The trio had lied to them. The trio had infected Black with subroutines she didn't have access to, logic bombs that she claimed she couldn't track down nor disable. Via Block communication, something not even Black could monitor, he and Dunn had spoken at length on the subject. The result? Every operation normally handled with Black's automation was to be checked by a human being. Period. For Oaks and Noble, that meant a lot more time spent in the control stations and an extended stay in VR. For the infantry, it meant his marines shouldn't trust all of Black's intelligence. Even cam feats might be suspect. That thought chilled him to the bone. As the craft's lights shined across Red's hull, he wondered if what he saw through his own cam feeds was real. Only way to find out would be to EVA from the support craft, 
lift his visor and inspect every surface with his own eyes. But that presented other challenges like a limited flight HUD and a lack of blindness protection. Without the first, he'd lose auto-targeting based on light motion detection. The other? He didn't like to think about suddenly being struck blind by an unexpected flash of a nuclear detonation without his visor. Eh, he could try that experiment later when he had Copenhaver in the gunner seat. And we're not tomb robbing, he said aloud. Talby pumped the thrusters, reoriented the craft's attitude, and slid parallel to the much larger ship. The powerful lights revealed the hull's patched seams and pitted surface. All three SNR ships looked the same. Without the two ships' insignias printed on their hulls, it would be nearly impossible to tell them apart, except for one major detail. His teeth clicked together as he saw the irregularly shaped dents in the foreplates. The dents looked as though they were more than a few centimeters deep, perhaps even penetrating to the inner layers of Atmos steel, but the gaping hole near the bow was the most relevant detail. Captain, he said. Go ahead, Dunn said. You seeing this, sir? Yes, the captain said. We see it. Black says the damage appears to extend all the way into the personnel quarters. Tommy nodded to himself. That makes sense with what I'm seeing, right into the non-rate coffin bay. When the captain spoke again, Talby detected a layer of depression lurking beneath the words. Continue to the other side, Lieutenant. We need to know if there are any other surprises waiting for us. Aye, sir. He muted his comms. See the other side? Shit, I'm checking everything. He pushed the thruster controls and the vehicle's slide slowed as he passed the ship's nose. After changing attitude to face red, he scanned the bow. Unlike the damaged area he'd seen earlier, the ship's starboard side seemed undamaged apart from the usual pits, Atmos steel patch lines, and other cosmetic defects. It all looked... Tommy hit the thrusters again and brought the craft to a halt. The strong spotlights illuminated the cargo bay door in fine detail. The door's left side was slightly pulled out of its frame, the metal swept back as though pried open by something incredibly powerful. Void wept, he breathed. Talby, Dunn said. Aye, sir. What does that look like to you? If he hadn't been in his suit, Talby would have scratched his chin. Like something big tried to get in, something strong. He let his eyes rove over the image, purposely allowing them to unfocus. A discoloration in the corner of the camera feed caught his eye and he zoomed in. A looping burn scarred the hole just a few meters away from the cargo bay door. Oh shit, he said. What is that? Dunn asked. Talby tried to force away the goose flesh crawling up his spine, but failed miserably. Sir, I think one of our starfish buddies was here. He adjusted the attitude to better focus the lights on the beaters of hull surrounding the discoloration. Dozens of lines of scars appear beneath the light. Shit, Talby said. Black, how many of those? Twenty-two unique lines of discoloration, the AI said. Got an estimate of how many creatures? Talby asked. Considering the minuscule size of the sample data we have from our encounters at Mira, such a request would be highly inaccurate as well as imprecise, Black said. He blinked. Did she just try to be sarcastic? So that would be a no. Correct, she said. That would be a no. In any other circumstance, one where he wasn't worried about being attacked, he would have taken the opportunity to tweak her nose, try and confuse her with lexical ambiguities, but this was not that time, and this wasn't the same black. Lieutenant, Dunn said. Continue the patrol. I don't want to put this off too long. Aye, sir. While adjusting the craft's attitude, he checked all the cams looking for the telltale shimmer of the starfish carapaces. Well, at least the ones they'd seen at the end had shimmered. Considering the creatures seemed to absorb nearly all light, he wouldn't be able to see them unless they tripped past one of the millions of distant stars. Lieutenant, may I connect with your block? Black asked. Talby glared at the control panel, as if she were sitting before him. Why? I can better alert you to threats than your onboard computers, she said. No, thank you, Black, he said, the words clipped and crisp. Acknowledged, Lieutenant, Black said. The SV-52 continued gliding across the ship, 
his cameras catching every possible area on his side of Red's body. More scars came into view, more distressed metal, more signs that something bad had happened. He finished the next complete sweep after checking the engines. They didn't appear to be damaged, but it was impossible to know if they were wrecked on the inside of the ship. He drifted from the aft to the bow. More signs, but no perforations detected. Most importantly, no active wildlife. What do you think, Black? He asked over private comms. The AI was silent for a moment. A new window appeared on his HUD, showing graphs of heat detection, electromagnetic emanations, and radiation. There was no useful data, Lieutenant, Black said. Like all SFMC vessels, SNR-class ships used extensive shielding to mask those emissions, but there was always leakage in a near-vicinity scan. My sensors are not detecting power of any kind. That's what I thought, Talby said. Even while he scanned every meter of the hull after seeing the cargo bay door as well as the large perforation, he'd held out hope that someone inside might still be alive. But you knew, he said to himself. Yeah, he did. Talby to Dunn, he said. Go ahead. Sir, I think we're clear. Apart from the cargo bay and the single perforation in the hull, she's intact. Reactor's cold, nothing on and nothing moving. In the silence that followed, Talby wondered what the rest of the command crew were thinking at that moment. Were their heads spinning with images of torn apart corpses floating somewhere inside a ship that was nearly identical to their own? Or of the friends they had in Red Company? Or was it just the fear of finding the monsters inside? Lieutenant, Dunn said, start your plan. Aye, sir, Talby said. The same squad had been trapped inside Mira for hours, and now they were heading into another lightless, oversized coffin. As if that wasn't bad enough, he, their commander, was going to be the one to ferry them straight into it. It was the right call, and they were the right Marines for the job, but that didn't keep him from hating himself all the more. <laughs>